Are you ready to get your pilot certificate? People are dreamers. In fact, pilots are possibly some of the biggest dreamers of all. The desire to leave the ground, either recreationally or as a career, requires someone with a healthy imagination. Experiencing the world from above is a common dream. We know this all the way back from when we were children. We see birds and airplanes overhead. We know that all of the cool superheroes fly, angels fly, and we know that we are fortunate enough to live in a time when we can fly too. You know, for, for more than a few seconds and, you know, well, sur survived the landing. Anyway, on this episode of the Powered Parachute Show, we talk about the top 10 things you need to get your pilot's license and we're going to get started right now. Unlike superheroes, we have to put a little effort into learning to fly. And if we want to take people with us, we want to do it safely. As it turns out, the FAA wants us to do it safely too. That's part of the reason for the pesky requirement that we meet certain training, knowledge, and experience requirements before they will let us fly anything more than an ultralight. This top 10 list is about turning those dreams into reality. Getting your pilot certificate is no small thing. There is a lot to learn and do, but it isn't that hard and there are flight instructors who are more than ready to help you achieve the goal of flying, whatever it is you want to learn to fly, including airplanes, gyroplanes, weight shift control trikes, or of course, powered parachutes. Powered parachutes are probably the easiest, so if you're considering them, you may have an easier path than others, but you still have a path to walk. Before you put your shoes on, let's talk about what you need to be successful. And as we get rolling here, please take a moment to subscribe if you want to see more aviation content like this. Your subscription to the channel and your likes for the videos are highly motivational to me. Thank you so much. Now, on with our list. Number one is health. This item began its life at the end of the list. It ended up being promoted to the top because it is so incredibly important. Powered parachuting is a moderately physical activity. You certainly don't have to be the picture of youth and health like, like I am, well, like I would like to be, but there is some pushing, carrying, and bending involved, and that is even before you get into the sky. There are less strenuous ways to fly. For example, airplanes and gyroplanes are about as automobile-like as you can get. The most exercise you get is climbing into the seat of one of those aircraft. Another thing that's it is, is mental health. It's a, it's a health issue also. The, face it, the younger we are, the easier it is for us to learn new skills. And flying a pirate parachute is a new skill. It requires some book study as well as some eye-hand foot coordination. Very doable even as a senior citizen. I've taught a few people who are decades past their 20s. But it is better to learn it sooner rather than later. It just gets more challenging the longer you wait. Time is number two. Learning to fly is not a weekend adventure. While it is true that under carefully controlled conditions, you can get to a solo flight in one weekend, that is only a milestone on the way to becoming a pilot. To get a sport pilot certificate for powered parachutes, you need 10 hours of dual training, two hours of solo flying, and 20 takeoffs and landings. I know what you're thinking, 10 hours. That sounds like a normal day with maybe a little bit of overtime. Why can't I get this done in a weekend? There's actually more than one reason. First, Students can only absorb so much training at one time. One hour blocks seem to be about right for the first few sessions and then those get a little longer as time goes on. You can't speed up learning no matter how many training montages you've seen in the movies. You also have to deal with weather. Unfortunately, powered parachutes are best flown in calm to modest winds. That's even more important for student pilots. Not only is a more textured sky more difficult to fly in, it is hard for a student to be able to tell if the aircraft is reacting to pilot inputs or something the wind is doing. So ideally, you get one hour of training early in the morning and one hour in the late afternoon. Two individual hour-long sessions per day in the 12 required sessions equals six days. And those are six nice days without rain or all-day high winds. I estimate that it takes about two weeks to get it done if you're working with average weather. That is a two-week vacation or a heck of a lot of weekends if you have to travel. And honestly, most students have to travel to find an active powered parachute instructor. Number three is money. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, if the best things in life are free and powered parachuting is so darn great, why isn't it free? 
That one, my friends, we will leave to the economists and the philosophers. All I can say is that most of the flight instructors I know enjoy eating. Well, that and I don't know anyone who is becoming a millionaire in the powered parachute flight instruction business. Some people confuse powered parachute instruction with airplane flight instruction hourly rates. An airplane CFI is often a young person trying to build hours to get into the airlines or a retired person who is just doing it in order to share their accumulated knowledge. With the FAA requiring a lot of piloting command hours before a pilot can fly transport aircraft, a young pilot seeks flight instruction jobs. He or she knows that it is a great way to build piloting command time while earning a little cheese. But then they find those jobs relatively low paying because there are a lot of other young people and pilots wanting to do the same thing they're doing. That drives instructional prices down. Well, that and an airplane CFI can fly for eight hours a day. Powered parachute instructors only have an hour or two per day to sell. Bottom line is, learning to fly a light sport aircraft of any kind will cost you anywhere from zero to well north of $10,000. Zero dollars is the friends and family rate with really nice guys. If you have a deal like that, take advantage of it. I know a couple of people who have had offers like that through the years and didn't realize what kind of gift they were bestowed. Equipment is number four. This one's a little tricky though. In fact, a lot of people get this one backwards. They first buy themselves a great deal on eBay or somewhere, then they begin looking for instruction. Often they learn that their great deal may not have been that great. They may also get a little discouraged that it could cost them more to get a license to fly their 15-year-old machine than it costs them to purchase their low-hour gem. The truth is, it is best if you find an instructor first. An instructor can give you good advice on equipment purchases. More importantly, you may not need equipment at all with your instructor. They often, but not always, have their own training aircraft. Hopefully, that is the case because you will learn things about powered parachutes that will help you to make a be you a better consumer when you are ready to buy. Worst case is that you buy something that is illegal, unsafe, or not fully functional. Each instructor has brands they prefer to teach in, prefer not to teach in, and won't fly on a dare. It's simply best to find an instructor first and your ride second. Number five is the instructor. This guy is the one who will help determine how much time and money it takes to get you to your certificate. And yes, it'll probably be a guy, although there are a few exceptions out there. One of the ways he helps determine that is by where he's chosen to live. If he lives close to you, that's great. The further you have to travel, the bigger the investment in time and money. Talk with more than one potential instructor. Programs vary greatly in form, timing, style, and ultimately effectiveness. Find someone who trains the way you want to learn. Weather's number six. You are going to have to work around the weather. This makes training more challenging the further north you go. It also makes weekend training difficult. Say you want to learn to fly, but you only want to do it on weekends. First of all, join the club. So does everyone else. But even if you get an instructor to commit to a string of weekends, it will probably take a long time to get where you want to go. A couple of weekends worth of bad weather combined with other scheduling conflicts can stretch what looks on paper like a month and a half of training time into two years of hit and miss training. It's better for you if you commit to a stretch of time, especially if travel is involved. Then you could be on site for the morning and evening flights when the weather's good. When the weather is poor, maybe you can arrive a few days late, or if training goes really well, you can leave a little early, which leads us to number seven, which is flexibility. Flying light aircraft is not at all like flying the commercial airlines. Commercial jets need some serious bad weather to keep them on the ground. On the other hand, most light sport aircraft like calmer winds. Well, except for our rotary wing friends who don't seem to notice winds that would be a little too sporting for those of us in the parasports. In any case, learning to fly isn't like taking music lessons. It is outdoors and climate dependent. And if you're working with an instructor who does this part-time, you're going to have his schedule as well as your own on top of the weather forecast. And of course, by the way, the weather forecast doesn't always conform to, you know, the weather. So be prepared to wait for the proper window to fly and to not be able to fly on certain days at all. If you're a type A personality, this can be frustrating. Sometimes a little frustration is one of the prices you have to pay. Getting a first flight is number eight. This isn't at the top of the list, although I believe it could be for some people. I always recommend that you try to get a flight in a powered parachute before you go all in on getting your license. But for many, this is actually somewhat optional. 
I've flown with a lot of students and know a lot more powered parachute pilots that jumped feet first into the sport without an introductory flight. But face it, if you have some doubts, clear them up with a flight experience in an actual powered parachute. It may take the form of an introductory training flight with an instructor, but committing no further than flight number one might be a great way to test the waters and in the process get you completely hooked. You can't find a local instructor? Well, drive. Or perhaps drive to a fly-in where someone can take you under their big nylon wing and show you the strings. Number nine is study. This is really bad news for some people, I'm sorry. Yes, you're gonna to have to commit to some studying, not just flight training, but actual book learning. After all, you have two tests you're gonna to have to pass, and those tests are very different. The first test is a knowledge test, which is a closed book, multiple choice test. The test is not impossibly difficult, but it does cover material you have to study. The good news is that you can study and pass your knowledge test before you ever meet a flight instructor or touch a powered parachute. ASA has a good home study course for the Powered Parachute Sport Pilot Knowledge Test. Other companies have products too. And all of the test prep companies can give you the official recommendation that you need in order to take that knowledge test at an FAA approved testing center. The second test is your practical test or check ride. For that test, you will need your certified flight instructor to help you prepare. There are specific tasks that you will be tested on and your CFI knows those tasks and can recommend you for your practical test when you're done. And by the way, an excellent book for helping you prepare for that practical test can be found at poweredparachutebook.com. Finally, we have number 10, dedication. If you don't have the things above in abundance, you can still meet your goal of becoming a pilot if you have some dedication. On the other hand, you can have all of the things above and still not earn your certificate if you don't apply any dedication to achieving your goal. Dedication can also be described as focus. If you make becoming a pilot a goal and then map out the steps you need to take to achieve your goal, then that focus will help you earn your pilot certificate. This list is not meant to discourage anyone. Instead, it was put together to help you mentally prepare for what will ultimately be a very rewarding accomplishment. There are less than a half a million certificated pilots of any kind in the United States. That is 0.1% of the U.S. population. You could be one of those people, but like anything else worth achieving, it will take a little effort. Finally, if you are interested in powered parachute flight instruction in either the Midwest or in Florida, please visit the link to easyflight.com in the comments. And again, please remember to subscribe. Thanks so much for watching and blue skies.